Welcome to this session about uh, a new service in Azure, which was released last year, called Azure File Sync, which we'll be using to cloudify our Windows file server. So in this session, I will uh, show you how to configure a hybrid file server uh, based on the new service, Azure File Sync. And we will also have a look at how we can use uh, PowerShell Desired State Configuration and Azure Automation State Configuration to fully automate all of the necessary installation of the agent, registering the agent with the service, and, uh, and so on. So we will begin uh, with looking what are we trying to achieve here with uh, using Azure File Sync in the first place. Then we are going to have a look at how we do the deployment manually, because uh, personally, I like to do something manually just to see what the options are and what the process looks like, and then try to automate it. So this is what I'm going to show you first, um, how we do it manually, and then we're going to use uh, PowerShell uh, to perform the actual work. I'm briefly going to discuss monitoring and backup, but we won't use any a lot of time on, the, on that part because we are, want to dive into the demos and have a look at how we configure this and how we can uh, use desired state to, to accomplish the, the needs. So even though it might seem so, uh, the message to customers isn't that the replacement for, uh, for on-premise file servers is uh, OneDrive, OneDrive for Business, uh, and all the other services available in Office 365. Uh, that is very useful for document team sharing, uh, sharing documents and so on. But there are typically many companies still have dependencies on their file servers. They have applications that are stored there. Uh, they are storing application data and, and so on. So for most of the customers I work with, at least the file servers won't go away anytime soon. Uh, so, when looking into hybrid uh, environments, which most customers are doing this, these days, uh, we, are, we want to accomplish uh, reducing the storage footprint on our local storage system, because many customers are using virtualization, of course, that's kind of a standard these days, but it's kind of overkill to have several terabytes of static cold data on a file server hosted on a, on a SAN, which uh, uh, is replicating between data centers, uh, so it's, it's very expensive. The other thing we want to do is to centralize the data in one place, so we can use uh, a storage account in Azure as the cloud endpoint, uh, which is the term used in Azure File Sync, to, to store the data in one place, and we can optionally sync parts of it down to local uh, on-premise file servers around the world, for example, if you have different departments around the world. we can. Uh, can synchronize parts of the centralized data if you want to, the, to do that. Uh, the other thing is that we can reduce the management overhead. We don't need to uh, expand capacity when the drives is being filled up uh, due to more data growth. Uh, rather than doing that, we can enable a feature in Azure File Sync called Cloud Tiering. We'll show you a couple of options for that. And all of this in the end will, of course, make uh, the customer or, or company save money. So let's have a quick look at the, the architecture and how we can uh, take advantage of this new service. It was released, I believe it was in July of 2008, and they had a couple of sessions at Ignite in 2018 about how you configure this. But it's basically uh, uh, based around a file share, which is hosted inside of our storage account in Azure. I will show you that in a minute. Then you have the file server uh, locally, which the users can access the way they are used to, whether it's uh, SMB or NFS or the work folders feature uh, introduced in 2012 R2. So the, for the user or the application, it will be business as usual. They won't, they won't uh, notice any differences because that's kind of one of the important aspects of having a file server, that it's still local so that the user or the application still have fast access to it. So that will still be the, the factor. So there are, as I mentioned, a couple of features that we can take uh, advantage of. Uh, cloud tiering, so we can, for example, say that files older than uh, 365 days will be tiered to the cloud uh, and recalled on demand. This works very much like the OneDrive uh, feature, which is called uh, uh, access on demand. So the user can see the namespace of all of the files on the and the directories, um, but even if they are not locally cached, when the user is double-clicking on the file in Word or Excel or whatever, it will be transparently downloaded. Uh, cloud access, this might also be an important as uh, aspect for some customers, that uh, you're moving some services to the cloud, 
then you of course want to access uh, your data as fast as possible. So in some scenarios, it might make sense to di directly access the cloud endpoint because that will be available via SMB. As well as one additional benefit is that you can access the same files via REST API. So if you have, are building more modern uh, applications and you still need to, uh, and you want to access the same data using a more modern protocol, that is one option. Uh, then you have multi-site sync, so this can actually be a replacement for a DFS, repli a DFS replication if you're using that. So if you have one file server, for example, in Oslo and one in Copenhagen, you can use this to synchronize the content between them via the cloud endpoint. Uh, one additional point regarding saving money when we use this is to offload the backup of the system to the cloud, so we can use Azure Backup instead of having an on-premise solution backing up several terabytes of data. And of course, if you have, uh, let's say one file server is uh, broken or uh, for some reason fire or it uh, is a virus or, or for some reason it goes down, uh, then we have the option to get it up and running pretty quickly, especially if you have virtualization. I guess most people can spin up a virtual server in five to 10 minutes these days. You go ahead and install the Azure File Sync agent, register it with the same uh, uh, endpoint, and it will uh, download the namespace so that for the user, all of the data will be accessible immediately. You don't have to wait for a backup or restore operation, which might take hours, depending on the amount of data to, to finish. It will be instantly available. So you have, if you have automated this process, you can have the server up and running, running in maybe 15, 20 minutes, if you have everything set up accordingly uh, ahead of time. So the deployment, I'm going to take, uh, take you uh, through that very quickly. First, we have to set up a Azure file share in uh, Azure in a storage account. Then we have to deploy the sync agent to one or more servers that we want to synchronize against the cloud endpoint. Then we need to create what is called a, a sync group to make a mapping between uh, the storage account and the servers that we are registering to the service. So I'm going to quickly show you how you can do this. I also wanted just to mention briefly that uh, uh, there is a new Windows Admin Center integration. Uh, how many people are using Windows Admin Center or have looked at it? Maybe half of the room, that's good. Because that's where Microsoft is uh, investing uh, their uh, management. Uh, the, for those who are not using PowerShell or the command line, uh, all of the GUI stuff is not going into Server Manager anymore. It's uh, going into Windows Admin Center. So with the 1904 release of Windows Admin Center, they added the support for many uh, Azure services, not just uh, uh, Azure File Sync, but Azure File Sync is one of them. So by going into the server you want to deploy it to or managing on, you will find Azure File Sync on the, on the left there. Then you can see what version is installed. You can create the sync group from here. You can deploy the agent and so on. So if you are using, if you are not de deploying this on a large scale, if it's just one or two servers, you might prefer to do it, do it uh, this way. I just, uh, I won't show this, but I just wanted to, to mention it. Uh, then we also had uh, a new version of the agent uh, released uh, a couple of weeks ago uh, because, as I mentioned, the service was released in July last year, and I think the version of the agent at that time was version 3 or something. So they have constantly been adding new features and iterating uh, with support for, for example, in the beginning you couldn't have data deduplication enabled on the server. That was supported in version 5, I think. Uh, a prerequisite for installing the agent is that the Azure PowerShell module must be installed. Uh, in the beginning, it was only supporting the Azure RM or the older Azure version, which works only in Windows PowerShell. But in the new version, which was released now, it uh, also supports the AZ module, which is the new cross-platform module. So that's, uh, that's good to know that you can use the latest, latest and greatest uh, there. So I'm going to show you how you install and configure a file sync instance. Uh, I'm going to share all of the links and all of the scripts that I go through with you. Um, let's just have a quick look at the documentation. 
So everything I'm going to show you now is basically explained on the, on this uh, site, uh, which prerequisites you need to have on the server, uh, all of the steps that we have to go through to create a sync group, create a cloud endpoint. Everything I'm going to show you is available here, step by step, and also how you can migrate a DFS or deployment to use this in, instead. So this is more like our reference. Uh, let's go ahead and uh, look into some PowerShell code to, to do this. Uh, first, I just wanted to head into the portal and show you how you can do it from there. So if you go into the Azure portal, if you want to cr create an instance manually, you go into create a resource, search for Azure File Sync, and you will find it in the marketplace. So just go ahead and hit create, give it a name, subscription, resource group, and location. That's basically it. Then you will have a storage or an instance of Azure File Sync. If you have already deployed it, you can s search for storage sync services and bookmark it on the on the left, then you will see all of the instances that you have here. Now we have no instances deployed, but we are going to deploy one to our resource group, which we'll have a quick look at here, which is called uh, PSConf EU RG, RG. But now I'm going to create it from PowerShell. So here I've already logged on using Connect AC account, so we're already authenticated to Azure. Also, I can mention briefly that previously you had to run some of these commands from a server with the storage sync agent installed because the management module was bundled with the agent. However, with the, the new AZ modules, you now have an AZ.storage sync module, so you can use any computer and use PowerShell GET to install that. That is kind of uh, makes more sense that you don't have to install the agent just to perform some management operations. So now we're already uh, authenticated to Azure, then we're going to set some variables. Like you saw earlier, we had to specify the location, the resource group, give it a name. Uh, we are going to create a sync group, which is the relationship between the cloud endpoint and the, our server. And we are going to onboard our local server, which is our Hyper-V VM, uh, manually. And then we are going to onboard another one, which we are going to automate. Uh, here we are specifying that we want to place the copy on the file server on, a, on the D drive in this folder. And we want to enable cloud tiering with uh, a free space of 10%. I'm going to show you these options in the GUI in a bit. So the resource group was already created, as you saw, so we don't have to run this command, but we can go ahead and create the storage account. Uh, next, we need to retrieve the primary access key for the storage account in order to set the storage context to that uh, storage account, because we are going to use new AZ storage share to create the file share. So as soon as this has uh, completed, we're going to retrieve the key. and We'll have a quick look in the portal as well, uh, how it looks like there. Here it's provisioned. We're going to retrieve the key, uh, set the storage context so that all, the, all, all of the following commands will be performed against that storage account. Create the file share, and uh, let's have a quick look in, in the portal, uh, how this looks like. Here I'm just storing the file share in a variable because we need to reference it later on, so I'm just storing it in a variable. If we refresh this, we can see that we now have a storage account. So this, it's nothing special about this, it's a regular storage account. I'm not sure how familiar you are with Azure and storage accounts, but there are basically four different services or protocols you can use in a storage account. Uh, blob storage, uh, table storage, and queues, which you use mostly for uh, backend storage for applications and so on. But then we have Azure Files, which is just a hosted regular SMB file share hosted in the cloud. So there is no Windows file server behind this. It's just a native cloud service. So in, inside here, we have created a file share. That was the command that we previously ran. Just created a file share and set a quote on it. Uh, right now, the limit for a file share is five terabytes, but there is a public preview for 100 terabytes, which is available now. It's not available in the GUI, so if you sign up for the preview, you need to use PowerShell to provision the file share and specify 100 terabytes. Uh, so before the 100 terabyte limit was uh, available, we had to split the data into different shares, but now we can soon, uh, I think it's uh, right around the corner, it will become generally available, use the 100 terabyte shares. 
So if we go into this share, we can see that we can uh, connect to it using uh, a regular SMB, uh, where we have a PowerShell example, where we can use new PS drive and map it, or we can just use NetUse and map a network letter against it. So this is directly accessible from from uh, cloud services if you have a need to, that, uh, to do that. Also from Linux and Mac, for example. So this, is, this will be the backend for our cloud service. The next thing we need to do is to provision a storage sync service. So this is what we're, when I went to the marketplace and searched for Azure File Sync, this command is doing the creation of that. Should uh, be pretty quick. Uh, then we're going to create the storage group. I'll uh, just start this command because this one runs for a uh, couple of minutes and hit uh, hit the portal to show you what we're doing. So if you go back to the resource group, you see that we know how the storage sync service. And uh, here you can see the sync groups. Uh, it's available in the overview, but you can also find it find it down here in the sync groups. So inside of the sync groups, we have the cloud endpoint, which is what is being provisioned in the background right now because it takes a couple of minutes. So the storage account will basically be available here as the cloud endpoint. So if you hit this manually, you can see that we have to point a storage account and then to our Azure file share. So that's what we did with the PowerShell now. So in a few seconds, the cloud endpoint will be available. And the next part of the puzzle is to attach a server as a server endpoint. So the, those two endpoints will synchronize the content between them. But before we can do that, we need to provision, here you can see the cloud endpoint is available. Before we can add the server endpoint, we need to provision an agent because no, there are no agents available. Uh, the way we do that is we go to registered servers. Uh, we can find the download link to the Azure File Sync agent from the download center. So it's available for down level to 2012 R2. Uh, we go into our demo environment. Uh, it's open remote desktop here. So now I'm inside of our virtual machine called branch FS1. I'm going to install the agent. Let's just kick this off. And one of the, if you have a proxy server, you have to specify that. And one of the new features that was added in the version 6 release of the agent is the option you can see here to automatically update the, the agent when a new version is available. So you don't have to take care of upgrades. And also the bottom option here, collect data necessary to identify and fix problems. If your company have no restrictions regarding telemetry and so on, I would recommend having that enabled because if you are doing a support case with Microsoft, uh, it's very handy because then they ha already have all of the data to troubleshoot the problem. So that's very useful. Let's just go ahead and install this. Uh, while we wait for that, we can have a quick look at uh, or prepare the credentials. So if you were at the first session this morning uh, with uh, Walter, you saw that you should not store your password in clear text. I suppose a demo is is uh, OK. So here I'm just running set clipboard inside of a PowerShell file, so I don't have to make any typos when we're going to register the server. Because the next step is that it will pop up a message, check for updates, and then we have to authenticate to Azure in order to provision this agent into the storage sync service that we just created. So it will finish in a little bit. While we wait for that, we can uh, pr prepare a data disk for the, for the local server. We see that we ha don't have a D drive, but on the Hyper-V uh, layer, we have prepared our data disk. So we can just go ahead and, and uh, format and make it ready for use. Of course, this is something that the DSC configuration will take care of, so it will uh, perform the formatting and in initialization of the data disk as well. There we go. So now we have the, an empty data disk ready to go. The agent is installed, and then it should pop up in a few seconds with the registration wizard. We'll first check if there is a new agent available, but it should be up to date. 
Oh, I didn't have any internet access. Uh, I think the demo machine just rebooted, so I have to run one command in order to uh, give it internet access. Uh, just do this one, and it should have internet access. Let's see. So without internet access, I can't install this agent? Uh, you can install the agent. You can uh, download it and uh, install it, but you can't register it if the server can't uh, communicate with the Azure service. So it's, it's possible to get the IP addresses and DNS names in order to, to open only for the necessary IP addresses. So you don't have to give it internet access. You can uh, restrict it. So let's just give it one more shot. Now we're going to do it against the public Azure cloud. If it's a cloud solution provider or CSP uh, customer or subscription, you have to check the box in order to go to those endpoints. Okay, it's sending the request. Just a quick reboot of the server. Because I think it has cached the DNS lookups. Uh, while we wait for that, I can also mention that the, the way I configured this lab is uh, using a PowerShell module called Lability, which makes it possible to spin up lab environments using PowerShell DSE. So in order to spin up the environment I have here, which is one domain controller and four file servers, it takes, I think it's 25 minutes or something to fill the provision in an automated fashion. So if you're starting from scratch or you want to set up the environment on a, a different computer, it's very fast to get up and running. So I'm go ahead and share those as well with the, with the presentation. So if you want to test this out yourself, it's pretty quick to get up and running on, uh, on Hyper-V, that is. Right, now it seems to have internet access. Then it pops up a dialog box where we have to authenticate. So when it's authenticated, we have to choose the Azure subscription, the resource group, and the storage sync service that we have provisioned the servers in. So that is something you need to do beforehand. Let's just copy the password. Then we should be presented with a list with the Azure subscription, uh, the resource group, and when I've chosen that, it will actually prompt me one more time with the credentials, because this was just to get a list of what's available, and when I hit register, it will need credentials for actually registering the server. I suppose they could have provided an, an option to just reuse the credentials, but it, it was it is. And the password. Now we should see a message that it's successfully registered. So now it's just registered, but we still have to add it as a server endpoint to the, the, to the sync group. That we will go back and do in have a quick look at in the portal as soon as this finish. There we go, registration is successful. So this is everything we have to do on the server itself. So we will still have this empty D drive. Uh, so in order to, for it to be provisioned, we have to go ahead and add the endpoint. So if you go into registered servers, you can see that the server is not now online and available to be added to the sync group. This we can, of course, also do using PowerShell. So let's just go ahead and run this command, which will take care of, take care of that. So by do, using PowerShell to do this, it's also kind of automatically you get the documentation. So it's pretty, 
pretty neat. Uh, the alternative would be to use infrastructure as code. Uh, there isn't any Terraform providers for storage sync service yet, but I've made a, an ask for it. In the meantime, you can, of course, use regular Azure, Azure RM templates if you prefer that. Or you can just do it uh, this way using PowerShell because this is kind of a one-time uh, provisioning procedure while the agents uh, it depends on. So if you go into the portal again, we can see that the endpoint should now be available. Here it's pending, so it will be initialized in a second. Here we can see that we can enable cloud tiering, which the PowerShell command did. So this means that it will never be less than 10% available space. So if the cloud endpoint is one terabyte and the disk locally is uh, uh, 100 terabytes, it won't be uh, any less than 10 gigabyte available uh, at any given time. I can also specify the tier based on the number of days the file aged. If you have a large amount of data you want to initially uh, upload, you can also use uh, the service called uh, Azure Data Box to do the offline data transfer because it costs. Uh, there is a. It might. It might take a long time to to do the initial sync if you have, for example, 100 terabytes. Let's go back to the server and see if the folder is provisioned. Here you can see we at least have the namespace. And if we provision a file there, uh, it will sync immediately back to the to the service. I'm just going to fast forward here because we are running low on time, and I want to use most of the time on uh, the DSE resource. <coughs> so now we have uh, had a quick look at how we installed uh, Azure File Sync agent, registered it against the Azure service. Uh, so this was the manual way. If you are going to do this across a large organization with departments and file servers across the world, it uh, doesn't scale very well. So we want to automate it and have the whole of the, the all of the process in source control, for example. Before we dive into that, uh, just a few words about monitoring. So you have some options inside of the portal to see some graphs about the uh, upload, download activity, and so on. Uh, those data is also available in, uh, here you can see a screenshot of it. This data is also available in Log Analytics. So you can configure alerts, send email alerts, or send a notification to Teams or Slack or whatever based on results on this data. Uh, they are also coming with uh, some additional things here regarding uh, alerts, email alerts uh, directly from the portal. You also have the option of using some of the performance counters. So we have a few of them here, which you can use to measure the amount of data that is being downloaded and uploaded. One of the um, new features in version 6 was that you can have uploads and downloads in parallel. Earlier on, you had, if you wanted to upload a new file, it had to be queued until the uh, download operation in progress finished. But now it can do both in parallel. So, yeah. You can, of course, use performance monitor, but these days you might want to use a more modern approach, such as Grafana, to integrate the, the monitoring of the service inside of your day-to-day uh, -day operations uh, systems. Uh, backup, you, as I mentioned earlier on, you can use Azure Backup, which have a number of options. You can use an agent directly on a server. You can use System Center DPM or Azure Backup Server, which is essentially the same thing. Uh, but in this case, we want to use Azure File Share backups, which is currently in preview, but that makes you, it possible to back up the cloud endpoint on the Azure side, so you don't have to back up the data uh, locally. And what is cool about that is you can also access previous restore points from the file share. You can just mount a drive, a drive letter on your, a management station or whatever directly into a recovery point in Azure and just copy out the, the files that you want. So it's a pretty, pretty neat feature. Also in the previous release, uh, they added support for backing up and restoring the NTFS ACLs on the files. That was not being done previously. That is, of course, something that we would need if we want to use this in our enterprise. And of course, uh, backing up with PowerShell, if you want to have uh, in the current state of the Azure Backup File Share Preview, you can back up, I think it's 120 days of retention time. But if you use PowerShell, you can configure backups uh, using snapshots up to 10 years. So that should cover the needs for, for most people. So I won't spend any more time on Azure File Sync as a teacher. If you are more interested in additional details, 
I would recommend checking out these Ignite sessions. Uh, now I'm going to use the last uh, 15 minutes of uh, the Azure File Sync module that I created. So on the PowerShell gallery, there is a Azure uh, or a PowerShell DSC resource called Azure File Sync DSC, which takes care of the process of registering the agent and adding it as a server endpoint to a sync group. And uh, it can, uh, you can also use the existing package resource, which is already available in the in DSC, to install the agent. So then you can put these things together in a configuration in the desired state and fully automate the, the process. So I'm going to dive into that. As I mentioned before, while we were waiting for the VMT reboot, I'm using Lability to provision the uh, lab environment, as you can see on the far right. So I'll uh, share every, all of the scripts and DSC resources will be available in my uh, Git repository. So if you follow me on Twitter, it will I have a scheduled tweet for 16.15, so we can find it in a few minutes. Then let's look into the last demo, which will be the DSE resource. Sorry, can you just pull up slides to do that? Yeah, sure. There you go. Then let's go back to VS Code, and we should have a new demo script here. Uh, so the way I created this, uh, if you are we're used to working with the side state configuration. You might know that there are two ways to create a DSE resource module. One is a script-based one, uh, which is based on uh, MOF files, and the second one is class-based. So since the agent supports 2012R2, which had PowerShell 4 included, uh, I wanted to I wanted to it be able to work natively with. Uh, with 2012 R2 without upgrading it to uh, version 5 or 5.1. That's the reason I wanted to use a script-based resource. Uh, but of course, uh, I could have used a class-based one instead. But uh, the way I created the script-based one was to use the DSC resource designer, install it from the gallery, create uh, the directory for the agent. So this was just on a, the local machine, just to create the agent and test it out on a, on a server. Uh, create a module manifest uh, using the regular commands that you might uh, be used to if you are uh, creating PowerShell modules. Then we will use the DSC specific uh, uh, commands to create the necessary properties. For example, the file sync instance, we want that to be the, the key, uh, the unique attribute, so we can't have any more instances with the same name. Uh, then you will have, you want to have support for ensure, so you can ensure that uh, it's present or absent. And then we have some metadata about the, which subscription, which resource group, and of course a, a credential which have a, a service principal or a, a user account with the uh, necessary permissions to perform the operations against Azure. And then you can go ahead and create the resource using this command. So this I already run beforehand. Everything is available in my GitHub account. I'm just going to open it in VS Code there, so we can have a quick look at the, the layout. So if we start uh, looking at the first the manifest, it's nothing spectacular here. It's just created based on the parameters I gave it earlier on. Uh, if we go into the DSC resources, we will have the two DSC re resources available. One is for installing the agent, and the other one is for, for, uh, or excuse me, for registering the agent, and the other one is for adding the server endpoint to an existing uh, sync group. So if you go into this and have a quick look at the, the MOF file is what was being generated by the PowerShell commandlet that we just had a quick look at, and in the PSM1 file we have the get, the set, and the test for performing the operation. So the get command, which will uh, uh, retrieve information about the provisioned in uh, the provisioned instance, the set which will uh, provision it or register it if it's not already registered. So here we're just using what was installed by the agent, uh, authenticating using the credential and uh, registering the server. So this is basically what we did earlier on using the AC PowerShell module. So I guess I could uh, go ahead and replace this and rather install the AC module and maybe convert it to a class-based module because the AC module requires PowerShell version 5. So 
might well, as well just go ahead and, and do that. But it's not a big transition to do. Uh, you can just reuse the same logic and make some some changes to it. And uh, of course, the last one, which is test target resource, which will just go ahead and see if the specified server is uh, registered and uh, return true or false based on the, the logic. The same thing is true for the endpoint. Basically, the same commands that we ran earlier on. Uh, so let's just go ahead and uh, uh, provision a new server, this time using DSC. Uh, we have another server called branch fs2. Now we're on the one server. Uh, we're going to onboard it to Azure Automation DSC. And uh, the configuration I'm going to show you in a minute is already pre-uploaded to Azure Automation DSC. I'm having a new session on Friday morning about Azure Automation, uh, where I'll go into more details about how you can uh, onboard servers to Azure Automation. But basically, you just go ahead and upload the configuration and compile it inside of the Azure, Azure Automation service, which will act as the DSC pull server is the, in this scenario. Then you have to provide a registration URL and the key that you can get from the automation account, which I will talk more about on Friday. You can use this script from the Azure Automation team, so that is available in Azure Automation documentation in order to generate the necessary uh, MOOF file to onboard the server to the service. So let's just go ahead and generate the MOOF file, and we will run this command. Now it's created a meta MOOF file that is basically a configuration file for the DSC client with instructions which build server it will use to get download its uh, configuration. So by using this command, set DSC local configuration manager, we can go ahead and apply that configuration to the server. And when we run update DSC configuration, we tell it to go ahead and uh, pull the latest configuration from the service. If I don't run this command, it will do it automatically, but it will take some time. So while this is running, it will take, uh, I think it's two or three minutes. Uh, we can have a quick look at the configuration. Uh, so this is the DSC resource. If we close that and have a look rather on the DSC configuration itself. Uh, I think we have it here. So here we have first, we have a configuration file with the information about the servers that I want to create uh, configurations for, with information about which local path do we want to use, do we want to use cloud tiering, and so on. Uh, and if we go into the configuration itself, we can see all of the things it is going to do. So here we can see that we are, here are just hard-coded where it will download the MSI file too, but this could be just a temporary location. Uh, then I'm going to retrieve some information from Azure Automation variables. Uh, I'll go into more details on Friday, but basically, instead of hard coding things inside of the configuration, you can just dynamically retrieve it from the Azure Automation service. That is both variables and uh, PowerShell credentials that uh, you can store encrypted inside of Azure Automation. Then you have to import the necessary DSC resources. For example, I have to use this one because I'm using X remote file to download the agent to the local path that you just saw. Then I'm using the built-in service resource to ensure that the file sync service is always running. And of course, that is dependent on the package, so it will need to be installed first. Then you're using the native package resource to install the MSI file, so here we have to point to the product ID that it will check in the registry whether it's installed or not, and we want to use the quiet argument. And of course, that depends on X remote file because we need to download the MSI before we can install it. Uh, next, as I mentioned, you have to have the Azure PowerShell module installed. Then you can use the package management DSC resource to just point to the name and the version of the module you want to download. I would uh, highly recommend that to specify a required version because if you don't, it will just pull down the latest version, and of course, it might be breaking changes, so always hard code dependent resources uh, if, uh, if you can. Then it's going to use the resources that I just showed you, uh, the one for uh, performing the registration, and then it will use the variables that it dynamically retrieved from Azure Automation to put it inside of the, the correct subscription and, uh, and so on. Uh, then we are also, as I mentioned, uh, waiting for the disk to be available from the uh, hypervisor. Uh, it's going to format it with the letter D and uh, 100 gigabyte. 
and it's also going to create uh, the demo data, data folder. Uh, lastly, it is going to create a sync server endpoint uh, with cloud tiering. It's uh, getting those that information from the configuration data that I just showed you. So nothing is hard coded here. It's just uh, retrieving it uh, dynamically. Uh, so we can have a quick look if it's uh, finished. Here we can see that it took uh, right under three minutes to provision. Uh, so now we should see on that server, I should have shown you beforehand, but if you go into branch FS2 on the D drive, we should hopefully see that we have the same data there. Before I run the DSC configuration, there was no file there. I can also quickly show you the tiering. Uh, if I right click this file, you can see that it's zero bytes on disk. And if I double click it, it's transparently being downloaded. No, it wasn't any content here, but as you see, for me as a user, it was uh, a transparent operation. So if this was a 100 megabyte file, of course, you might notice a slight delay, but uh, mostly users are working with hot files. It's not very often they are retrieving cold, cold data that this has not been accessed. So as I mentioned, the DSC resource is available on GitHub. Uh, there I have, uh, there you can provide issues if you are trying this out and something is not working. Uh, the last uh, script here is showing you how you import the configuration to an Azure Automation account and uh, compile it. So here we're just running a command to import it, specifying the file that we just looked at, which contains the configuration. And then it will be available in Azure Automation. And when you have imported it, uh, if you have worked with DSC, you know that you, before you can uh, use a configuration on a DSC client, you have to compile it. So the PowerShell uh, file or the PowerShell uh, configuration will be converted to a MOF file, which is the native language for the, the DSC uh, feature. So I can just briefly uh, show you inside of Azure Automation uh, that the node should be available there. If you look at state configuration, we see that we have branch FS2 and it's compliant, and it was last seen a couple of minutes ago when the configuration finished. And here you can see that it's compliant for all of the steps that I just showed you. And of course, this server was, uh, can be running server core or whatever, so it's uh, pretty easy to uh, fully automate all of the installation uh, on a headless server. Uh, the key takeaways, so that was the demos, is to take advantage of storage by not compromising the on-premise experience. By that we mean that the end users should not notice any difference besides working with older cold data. Uh, you can reclaim uh, space for other purposes on your uh, fancy expensive local SAN, and you can also offload your on-premise backup uh, environment by using Azure Backup instead. And it's rather easy to get started. As you saw, there was good uh, documentation if you want to do it manually. It's easy to perform it using Windows Admin Center if you're just having a couple of servers. Or you can use configuration management, such as DSC, to fully automate all of the setup. Uh, all of the presentations, I created a pull request, which is pending, I think, in this repository. If not, uh, I'm also scheduled a tweet, which points to my own repository, which will contain all of the scripts that I showed you. Uh, some resources, uh, links to the documentation, uh, slides and demos from this presentation. And also I have a blog article about liability, how to get started with that. Uh, if you want to use Hyper-V on Windows 10 to provision uh, lab environments, it's pretty easy and a great feature. I think that was everything I had to show you. Uh, I'm open to questions if you have any. Yes? Yeah, did you? Yeah. Um, how are ACLs actually handled? Because you said, I saw before that you are able to handle ACLs now, which were not initially in the product. How is it done? Because the Azure endpoint basically doesn't know how. So the question is, uh, how is uh, ACLs handled on the cloud endpoint? Because as I mentioned, uh, the latest version made it possible to backup and restore. Uh, uh, data on the cloud endpoint, uh, including the ACLs. But if you're accessing the data directly on the endpoint, how is the ACLs enforced? That is your question, right? So it's two questions. Uh, so in the early phase, when you looked at it, there was no ACL integration at all. Now, do you have that for the server endpoints, as far as I understand? 
That's correct. For the server endpoint. And it's, what is the status for the cloud endpoint? The cloud endpoint, uh, if you use uh, NetUse and connect directly to the end cloud endpoint, uh, as far as I know, they don't have any integration there yet. It's only for backup and restore purposes. But they are working with the integration with Azure AD domain services, if you know that. That is a hosted uh, Active Directory environment. Uh, so I guess it's that they, they are going to use that in order to get native uh, NTFS uh, ACL enforcement on the cloud endpoint. But uh, you're right, today it's not uh, possible to, to do that. So you need to be careful if you are going to let end users access it. It's maybe not a big deal if it's just an application, but if it's end users, you may want to wait uh, using direct access to the cloud endpoint. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. That the question is how does this work with uh, your local backup uh, solution? So if you are not using Azure Backup, you are using an on-premise solution to backup the data. What will happen if you have cloud tiering enabled and the backup solution will uh, go ahead and backup the data? Then it will recall all, the, all of the data and the tiering is useless, right? But uh, Microsoft together with the storage vendors, I think it was uh, two or three years ago, they have this uh, plug fest uh, once a year, I think, where they discuss new features and such. So inside of the NTFS file system, they created a new attribute. I think it's called partial on recall or something, which the backup software needs to support. So when that attribute is set, you're basically saying that you trust uh, so it won't recall the data. But it was a good question. So you need to ensure that your backup software supports that new attribute. But it was released a couple of years ago, so I expect all of the major uh, renders to support it. Other questions? Yes? So the question is, uh, is uh, file locks uh, enforced. So if one user is working in Oslo and one in Stockholm, for example, on synchronized data endpoints, what will happen? Uh, today, uh, it will behave like uh, OneDrive. So if you are using it on two different computers, it will have duplicate the file and have the computer name, I think, uh, on uh, the timestamp in uh, parentheses. But they are working on a new feature called Global File Lock, which will take care of that. But that's not available yet. But it's a great question. Other questions? All right, feel free to catch me up later on if you have any additional questions, and uh, thank you for watching.